Strange things are happening at Jake's junkyard. Help people's my business, huh? Up in. Great. Things that no one can explain. Well, what do you suppose these stupid hicks know about fixing cars? No! Well, I imagine they know a whole lot about fixing cars. I mean, what else they got to do around here? Things that no one can believe. I won't take girl, and I'm gonna have her. Do you think she's pretty? I think she's pretty. What you want with a cripple, anyway? Things that are only ah. supposed to happen in bad dreams. Come on in and meet the family. What have you done to my mother? <laughs> well, there's a little girl out in Salt Lake City who could use that heart. Might bring about uh, 40, 45. That's the last time we inviting strangers to dinner. Why is your daddy doing this to me? Because he wants to fix you. Fix me? Dang, real. If you break down in Jake's neighborhood, say your prayers and run like hell. They're drugged, right? Kick them and see. Please help me. I'm sorry. I can't. Praise the Lord. Another convert. I'm gonna kill you. I made two of and the first thing you do is run out on me. You little whore. Now this is going to hurt. I knew something like this was gonna happen. salvage. If Jake can't fix it, it's been dead too long. Blood Salvage, aka Mad Jake, is a 1990 comedy horror film directed by Tucker Johnson. The film stars John Saxon, Lori Birdsong, and Danny Nelson in the lead role as the organ harvesting, evangelic, and enigmatic genius Jake Pruitt. The film tells the story of Jake's salvage yard, ran by him and his two sons, Hiram and Roy, who specialize in salvaging human organs to be sold on the black market. Now, it may sound kind of run in the mill, but what sets this film and Jake himself apart from other horror slashers is his tendency to preach the Bible and even sing to his unfortunate victims who he keeps alive as an audience to his bizarre religious will views. be made whole again. Praise the Lord. And all God's children said. And all God's children said. And even kidnapping a family whose handicapped daughter has caught Jake's eye. And then we learn not all of Jake's motives are as dastardly as they seem. The film does indeed have some comedic elements, like Elvis being one of Jake's victims. Amen. Amen. I don't want to talk to any of your stupid friends. They think. But it definitely leans more into the bleak horror side of things, like the first victim being the little brother, who gets his spinal fluid drained and even gets beheaded. Blood Salvage was the last film to be released from Paragon Arts International, who released the Kevin Tinney classics Night of the Demons and Witchboard years earlier, and was also co-produced by then heavyweight champ Evander Holyfield. I couldn't find much info on exactly why he decided to produce a horror film, or even more strangely, why he decided to do a cameo in it. Check him out. Oh, hold on there, hold on there, macho man. Wait for the bell. Give me the bell there. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a blind pup. I better not find you around here later. Speaking of cameos, we get Ray Walston as one of Jake's black market patrons. And while it's a small part, he was always a welcome presence. Paragon Arts kind of fell apart during the supposed marketing of the film, and it kind of got lost in the shuffle of other great horror movies released that year, although it did have a life on late night cable. 
The film has been compared to Motel Hell and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series, and that they contain a vile family kidnapping and using human bodies for their own personal gain. And ironically, later in the Chainsaw series, they seem to have some parallel thoughts. And while Mad Jake may not be as menacing a foe as Leatherface, he's still pretty badass. Check out how creepy he can be, and how veteran actor Danny Nelson demands the screen. Pretty little girl like you shouldn't cry. Besides, you're going to like it up here in Helen's room. See, that's Helen with the boys there. Uh, we lost her a few years back. The doctor said she needed a new heart, but they couldn't seem to find her one. Oh, there was plenty of hearts to go around, mind you. Just had to know the right people. And I guess I didn't. There's even a kind of creature feature vibe with the scenes featuring the salvage yard's alligator protector. There are a lot of iconic scenes in this movie. Let me show you my favorite one. Boy, don't die. Brother. Wake up. You stupid half-wit. I told you she was a slut. Another big difference between Mad Jake and the other horror icons of the time is his motive. He plans on fixing the disabled girl, helping her to regain the use of her legs, the thing that she feels is really holding her back. Jake probably could have gone about it a bit better because she was just not appreciative of what he's trying to do. I make you walk and the first thing you do is run out on me. And she winds up torching Jake to a crisp. <laughs> Maybe the harvesting of her family for their body parts left a bad taste in her mouth. And although the film was left open for a sequel, I'm a special person. I can do anything I want to do. And I'm going to fix you back up. It never happened. And this remained Danny Nelson's only leading role. Although he did stay busy throughout the 90s. And in his latter career was able to work with some good directors and make some good movies until his death in 2010. Another lasting legacy for Danny Nelson is his duet with Christian Hessler both in character as Jake and Hiram Pruitt, singing the gospel classic, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb, in the end credits. Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you gone? Oddly enough, the little brother in the film, Andy Greenway, has a bit part in the film career opportunities, along with Danny Nelson. And John Saxon, along with co-star Ralph Pruitt Vaughn, both appear in the classic 1980 film, Cannibals in the Street. Blood Salvage definitely has its place in 90s horror history, even though it's rarely seen or spoke of. John Saxon has spoke about enjoying his time on the film, and would even happily take pictures with the cast and crew, and in some cases, their moms. Ironically, the cars used in the salvage yard have become kind of a holy grail for car collectors, with nearly all the rare and eclectic models featured also logged online by car aficionados. Monterino, you're gonna die! I've always thought Jake was quite a standout horror villain, and he definitely has a place amongst his peers. Really, with his burnt facade, he could easily be brought back for a sequel. I guess we can only hope Evander Holyfield decides to make some more movies sometime soon. I had the opportunity to talk with makeup effects guru and artist Chet Zar, who worked on this film. In fact, this is an early career highlight for Chet. Let's check that out. 
that's the the least that's the least of what I've done in the movie business. I worked on like Planet Planet of the Apes and The Ring and The Grinch and shit. It's funny. Yeah, let me see who worked on it. It was for Tony Gardner's shop. Tony Gardner was the uh, the boss. Alterian Studios. Um, this was right after we did the Blob, and it was it was. I don't know if it was a friend of Tony's who was doing this movie because the the Blob was like this big ass budget effects extravaganza, and so then we went right into um, Blood Salvage, which was like a small thing that didn't have any money. And, but it was more like a fun project, and he might have been doing like a friend of his who worked on it a favor or something. So um, all we knew about it was we needed to make some um, dummies of people that had like, you know, mechanical, homemade mechanical devices put in them to keep them alive, to harvest their organs. And uh, yeah, and I was, I, I watched the movie, the link he sent me, because I'd never seen it. I had a friend send, send me a DVD, but I I, um, I uh, lost it. But um, they sh they hardly used anything. I can't believe it because they used all these shots of like people in makeup going like ah and saying stuff. But the the dummies we made were so good. They were so high quality because we had, like a, yeah because we used um, we used molds of people from the Blob like. Uh, and we had all these extra molds, so we were able to just cast kind of generic people from these life cast molds and, and use them. And it was really fun because it was just like there was not a lot of direction. It was just like make these cool, disgusting bodies that were hooked up to homemade like farm machinery um, parts. And from what I remember, we made a little, like a little kid. The one I did was a little girl who was like... They might not have used it because it was so horrible, <laughs> but she was kind of like uh, probably like a five-year-old little girl, and she, she looked like she was kind of crucified, and she had a, like a nightgown on and a, but, uh, like a pair of bunny slippers. It was really d awful. She had like her eyes sewn shut, I think, and like tubes sticking out of her. It was awful. And then there was... Uh, uh, let's see what else there there was the one that you did see in the film let me see I, the one I think you saw two of them in the film for just a second though one of them was like a headless woman sitting in a chair and uh, that was I forget who we used for the life cast but then there was a the, uh, it just had like tubes coming out of the neck and stuff and uh, then we had a lady that had the top of her head cut off and her brain was exposed. And that may have been, you may have seen that in the shadows in one shot. And that was actually, yeah, that was um, Candy Clark's live cast, I think. Candy Clark was the waitress, I think. Um, and it, yeah, she dies in a phone booth. A phone booth, like, collapses on her. The blob, like, yeah. So that was her cast. Just, like, we had her head cast for that effect. So we just poured it up in clay, and then we re-sculpted it and put the brain in it. And um, that one was pretty cool. And then the only other one I remember was this black woman. And um, it was like this heavy set black woman. And I think the, the cast we used was, oh, I forgot the actor's name. It was an older black guy in the blob who was... Um, because we so we used I think we used his the mold from his head and then just put like a, a wig on it and dressed it up like I think yeah I don't think anybody knows that I doubt anybody I'm sure nobody knows that <laughs> have you ever seen cows how cows have uh, sometimes they put like holes in the sides of cows so you can see the digestion happening have you ever seen that in like dairy farms or something it's really gross and disgusting and they like can open it up and put their hand in and feel around in the cow's side we put those in the in that lady's uh <laughs> in her stomach so there was these there was like these portholes in her side to where you could see the guts inside <laughs> it was really nasty i might have 
that pieces of that lady in my attic. I know I had her her arm forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was it. I think those were the only bodies. And then I did. The, I also sculpted the um, John Saxon wound in his side, where he had all the tubes in his side. So he came in for a life cast, and we did a life cast on his side, and I sculpted that. And um, he was cool. He, he was cool. He was like just came in, got a cast, and and left, and that was it. But we didn't. We were not set for anything either. We just shipped everything to to set. And then the on-set makeup artist did all the stuff. If they put two of them in the shots, and one of them was like a headless body with tubes in it, in its neck, so that's pretty disturbing. So if they're going to put that, they're going to dress the set with the other ones. They were just, I think they were probably just in shadow, and they didn't take advantage of them. And for some reason, they 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 wanted the people that were moving and stuff, but um, they didn't, you know. The makeups were not that good on those. There was no effects to them. They were just like, they had like white makeup on kind of. <laughs> I think, well, we finished working on the blob on in 87 or 88. So it probably was like around 89. And right after, right after, right after we did that, I think we did uh, Darkman. Right after Blood Salvage, yeah. Because I remember we, we moved into this new shop. And then we did... Um, Blood Salvage in the new shop. And then we did Dark Man right after it. Um, Blood Salvage was like a, a little, tiny little filler fun job in between the the real jobs, kind of. You know what I mean? It was like something before Dark Man, something right after the blob. You know, we needed to move the shop over a couple week period, so might as well be you know working on this Blood Salvage movie. When I was first in the business, it was a big deal, you know, seeing your name in the credits. And But as time went on and the movies, you'd see that all your stuff gets cut out that you worked so hard on and the movie ends up being bad. It's kind of, it was kind of disheartening to, to really be like putting so much energy into making something really good. Like the blood salvage is, is a perfect example. I mean, we made, we, we, went above and beyond to make these amazing authentic looking dummies they're really creative really uh i mean like they were really good it's like they had really nice wigs i don't know if the wigs were the tone were like professionally ventilated wigs that were really expensive i don't know if he had them from other projects or what but the, it was just top quality and then to have it not even show up in a movie you start to like get kind of cynical about seeing them and it's like you, you know you only you only end up you know you'll go to the cast they usually do a cast and crew screening for the crew you know like a premiere type thing where all the all the crew is there and everybody kind of knows each other which is cool so i would usually go to those if it was um i don't even know if they do those as much anymore but back then they used to so i would go to those but as time went on and you see that your work gets butchered or cut out or the movie is just terrible, you start getting like, uh, okay. <laughs> There's a lot of movies I worked on that I that I haven't seen uh, before. Because <laughs> you just got to get cynical a little bit. But it was like, it was such a bomb when it came out. It really like, I, I you couldn't even get it anywhere to see it. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's so funny when you contacted me because nobody nobody knows about blood salvage except my friend andrew hawkins who sent me the dvd <laughs> and he because he knows all these weird obscure horror movies and it was cool to be able to finally see it because i'd never seen it i'm working on another episode featuring chet in the future and i'll be uploading our full conversation soon focusing mainly on his early career working on films until then, be sure to catch Chet's podcast, and be sure to see the documentary on the man himself, I Like to Paint Monsters. Such a great watch. And as always, we have some cool stuff coming up on the channel, so be sure to subscribe and share, and leave me a comment letting me know what you want to see on the show. Until next time, folks. You fucking slut of king! You fucking king! Don't forget to rewind.